Elaine Dardine aged 30 and Keith Dardine aged 29, a married couple who also had a son named Peter Dardine lived in Ina, Illinois. Keith, who was originally a native of Mount Carmel, after completing his training, which was required for the job he was seeking that is, a treatment plant operator, specifically at the Red Lake Water Conservancy District's nearby facility. He bought a trailer, mobile home of sorts. His wife, who was from Albion, moved in with Keith in the trailer with their two-year-old son. The land on which the trailer sat was rented from a nearby couple who farmed. Along with Keith, his wife also worked at a supply office store in Mount Vernon. Outside of work, the couple were also very active members of a small Baptist church. In 1987, the Dardine household was blessed when Elaine was pregnant with the couple's second child. Both Keith and Elaine decided that if the newborn is a boy his name will be Ian but if it's a girl, her name will be Casey. This new addition to the Dardine family made them think about their housing situation and they decided to move away and put their trailer on sale. The fact that Ina was too violent back then, with 15 homicides in past two years, played a major role in their decision, it was such a major factor that Keith was ready to move back to Mount Carmel even if it meant being jobless. The residents of Ina were clearly stressed and lived in constant fear. It did not help Keith's situation when his friend told him about a 10-year-old girl who was essayed and then unalived in May of 1987. All this paranoia got to Keith and he became so protective of his family that when a young woman asking to use a phone came by, he refused to let her in at any cost, he did not care to help anyone, he just wanted to keep his family safe and away from any potential danger, after all, the evildoers approach you in guise of asking for help. Keith was a very reliable operator at the treatment plant and always made sure to never miss any of his shifts, as such, when on November 18th of the same year, Keith failed to report for his shift, his superior found it very odd, for a diligent worker as Keith himself, it was out of the ordinary to not show up for work. Keith did not report his absence to his superior, which also very odd and did not return any calls made to his household that day. Concerned for his well-being, his superior called both of his parents, Don Dardine, his father and Joanne Dardine, his mother. The couple were divorced but still lived near each other in Mount Carmel. Unfortunately, none of them knew or could have imagined what happened to their son and his family. Don after the call, concerned about his son's well-being, called Jefferson County Sheriff's Office and agreed to drive down to Ina with spare keys to his son's mobile house and conduct a wellness check. Outside Keith's and Elaine's house they meet deputies and what they find inside are the lifeless bodies of Elaine, Peter, and a newborn girl. All the bodies were tucked into the same bed. Now what I am about to tell you can be very graphic but I will tone it down, regardless, prepare your stomachs. Elaine was bound and gagged with a duct tape and beaten to death, she was beaten so badly by the killer that she went into labor and delivered a girl, who upon birth met the same fate as her mother that is beaten to death. Peter's life was also ended in the same fashion. Murder weapon. Well, it was a baseball bat gifted to Peter by his father Keith on his birthday. At the crime scene, as Keith's body or Keith himself was not present, it was assumed by the police that he himself killed his family and was on the run, his car as well was absent from the place where he used to park it. A team of armed policemen went to his mother's house in hopes of finding him, although they could not find any clues and search ended the following day. However, a group of hunters who were passing by found Keith's lifeless body lying in a wheat field. Location of this wheat field was not that far from his trailer. Unlike his family, he was shot three times and his privates were severed. His car was also ultimately found but 11 miles away from his trailer, parked outside the police station in Benton, with the interior spattered with blood. News of the Dardine family spread like a wildfire, making the residents even more fearful and afraid than they had ever been. Many people started going on about their daily lives and businesses with shotguns clearly visible in their vehicle. 
After high school was over, students would rather wait inside the school building for their parents to pick them up rather than go hang out and socialize outside that they'd normally do. Early police reports released to public were limited and sometimes even contradictory, this led to spread of rumors and lot of speculation among the public. The circumstances under which Elaine gave birth, gave rise to stories that Casey, which was name of the newborn, was ripped outside from her mother's womb and the fact that Keith's genitals were mutilated, supported the speculation that Satanists were active in the area were behind this incident, performing a ritual and using the family as a sacrifice. Another speculation suggested crime to be a work of a regional serial killer. Dr. Richard Garretson, who was a family physician, talks about how many of his patients are disturbed after the Dardeen family homicide. A man who lived about half a mile away from Dardeen's could not sleep at all due to constant fear and had lost 14 pounds as a result of stress. Also unable to sleep was the Dardeen's landlord's daughter who kept lights in her bedroom on and read all night due to fear. Local police and Illinois State Police joined hands to investigate the Dardeen murders. A total of 30 detectives were deployed to work full-time on the case, following any possible lead in questioning suspects. Initially they took a man into their custody, this was a co-worker of Keith, with whom he reportedly had been having conflicts. Although he was released after being questioned as his suspicion was cleared. In the crime scene where Elaine and her children were found, investigators also found a very small number of certain drugs. But it was not enough evidence to connect them with any drug dealing, consumption was also ruled out as examination of bodies came clean of any drugs in their system. After the autopsy report, police quickly drew the conclusion that the drug may have been placed at the scene deliberately by the killer to throw off the initial investigation. No one in the town could think of anyone who may have had grudges against the family. It was also very hard for the detectives to piece together how the crime had taken place exactly. Keith's body was found away from the trailer and his car was also parked 11 miles away with blood spattered which may indicate he was not with his family when they were unalived and he was killed inside his own car, then dragged to the field. The investigation also revealed that the killer had a lot of time on their hands as they made sure to put all the bodies tucked inside the bed and clean up the scene as well, although it may have been an act to erase any evidence left behind. The question of whether there was only one killer or multiple was also open. Police were also unable to pinpoint any clear motive for murder. The back door was left open with no signs of forced entry, all the expensive items were still in their places, untouched, ruling out possibility of robbery. Any sexual motive was also out of the question as Elaine was not essayed. There were no signs of extramarital affairs that also ruled out any revenge, jealousy, or rage. Their record was extremely clean and they appeared as just one normal happy family. Police were never able to find out why they were targeted. At the time, this case made it big and reading one such news article, a police officer, expert in cults told the press that rumors about Satanists and rituals cannot be true at all as these groups mutilate corpses more extensively, harvest organs and leave various symbols and lit candles at the scene. None of which was found at the scene of Dardeen family murder. Keith's mother, Joanne suggested two possible motives, one being that someone offered Keith to sell drugs and he refused, other being, someone liked Elaine but she would not accept his advances so he took his rage out on her entire family. But all these are nothing but mere speculations with no concrete evidence or facts. With all the leads slowly dying down, the detectives assigned to this case moved on to work other cases. Two FBI criminal profilers came to the area to assess evidence but were not able to make any suggestions because the crime defied their typical analytical methods. Although the case was dying down, Joanne worked hard to keep public from losing interest in her son's case. Throughout the 1990s, she regularly called detectives assigned to the case to give them any lead that she had learned or share any new information that she had gathered. Joanne also gathered 3,000 signatures on a petition to the Oprah Winfrey Show, 
which was a daytime American syndicate talk show, to ask the producers to run a segment on her son's case, unfortunately they turned her down given the nature of case was too gruesome to be broadcasted on daytime television. Joanne also approached America's Most Wanted show, initially they also turned her down but later changed their mind and aired a segment in 1998. The show did not turn up any new leads. In 1999, when a serial killer named Tommy Lynn Sells was convicted of all his murders and crime, it caught the attention of investigators back at Illinois. While he was awaiting trial on his first murder charge, he began confessing to other murders he had committed while drifting around the country by hoping freights or other means. One of the confessions was about the Dardeen family. In 2010 he told the investigators that he met Keith at truck shop near Mount Vernon, although in some other version he tells he met someplace else but, in both versions, he says that Keith invited him for dinner. After dinner, Tommy was planning to move on but Keith triggered his anger by suggesting a threesome with Elaine. He forced Keith at gunpoint to the place his body was found, shot him, returned to the trailer and ended his family as well as they were witnesses. He changes his story again a third time, this time, there is no threesome suggestion and that Tommy came across trailer for sale and just thought it was a good opportunity for killing. He also mentions in this version that he essayed Elaine and after killing Keith, drove his car to Benton Police Station. To some his confessions were legitimate, but for the most part, his confessions were anything but legitimate. Tommy's claims were all on point with information released to public with some added made-up details. So, investigators asked questions regarding details that were confidential. He first answered incorrectly but then second time correctly, which may merely have been a lucky guess. Police in Texas where Tommy was being held said that he was trying to avoid death penalty by confessing to crimes he did not do and take advantage of judicial system's gratitude. Thus, Illinois police wanted to take Tommy to further investigate their case but Texas law did not allow inmates on death row to be taken out of the state. So, in the end there were no charges of Dardeen family murders on Tommy because of insufficient evidence but he was charged with 22 other confirmed murders. The doubts regarding the confessions were not limited to law enforcement, Friends and family of Dardeen's claim that it's highly unlikely that Keith would invite a complete stranger for dinner, given his paranoia regarding increased crime rates in the area. Also, there was no evidence which suggested Elaine was essayed so Tommy's claim also appears contradictory here. In my opinion Tommy's involvement in the case was a complete distraction and even muddled the case. By the time of Tommy's execution in 2014, Joanne came to believe that he indeed was not the person who killed her son and his family. Nothing he said matched up with what she knew about her son. For some people this case might have come to a close with Tommy's execution, but in reality, it's still one of America's cold cases.